Martin. Great. Well, again, thank you very much for having me as well. Um, I'm ex very excited to be here. Um, I'm Martina. I am from the Data Science Hub in the Ministry of Justice. And we have been working to harness operational data to try and make our prisons safer. Because stories about prisons can make for very stark reading. Um, they can be very hard to now realize, and especially realize there's real people behind them. And at the MOJ, it's our responsibility, responsibility to safeguard all offenders. And so safety in prison custody especially is one of our top priorities now. Because the statistics don't lie. Um, at any one point, we have about 83,000 people in prison custody in England and Wales. But annually, we see 34,000 assaults, 57,000 self-harm incidents, and just over 300 deaths. So this is a significant problem. The MOJ is working on it, firing on all axes, try to make a change. And so we want to know how can operational research help to stem the rising levels of violence? What can we do? How can we help? First step was a soft OR approach. What's going on? Because when we started to work out how OR can help, we came across a much bigger problem, which is that data just wasn't being used in prisons. Prison has come to rely on something called prison craft, sort of qualitative knowledge of offenders to try and meet their needs in those ways. And we found out that underlying that sort of culture were three problems with the data. Firstly, data wasn't up to date. It took like six weeks for data to go from collection to reporting. That just isn't timely enough for operational needs. Secondly, there was no real systematic understanding of violence in custody. People didn't realize, they didn't really know what was driving violence. And finally, even when there were insights, it wasn't reaching people. It wasn't being displayed intuitively enough. They weren't real insights. They were just numbers. And so we used all the OR expertise in our team, to working together with stakeholders from operations to policy to senior leaders to solve all three of these blockers in turn. And the end result is the safety diagnostic tool, as I'll hopefully, IT permitting, show you. So the first step, data wasn't up to date. Um, data was collected on the front line by prison staff meticulously, um, and then it would take weeks and weeks and weeks to make it back to them in useful information. So this is something I think a lot of you will recognize. You start with a lot of legacy systems, then every month, maybe every couple of weeks, you take an extract from those things. You end up with 12 spreadsheets. All of them get manually cleaned by hours and hours of, of you know, manual labor fixing them all. And you end up with 15 spreadsheets that all say something slightly different. No one really knows what the final version of the truth is. And so you've also spent six weeks essentially coming up with yet more uncertainty. So, what we've got a whole team of data engineers to do is turn it into this. Take all these legacy systems and turn it into one unified database that is queryable by us, the researchers, the analysts, the statisticians, and produces for us clean, flat files that are ready to go, ready for analysis. Now, this sounds like a wonderful, simple solution if you just throw some engineers at it. I just wanted to show you what that looks like in reality. So we've got a pipeline of open source tools built on the top of cloud storage um, that extracts the data using APIs, cleans it for us, structures it in a consistent way, and then puts our studio, JupyterLab, open source tools that a lot of analysts these days are familiar with at the end that directly talk to that. So what you've done with this is saved you six weeks because this runs every day. So if an officer in, in five o'clock on a Thursday writes down there's been a death in custody, the next person on shift the next morning knows and knows exactly what happened in the words of the officer the day before. And what that means that we now have all of this right at our fingertips to test all our hypotheses, all of our questions, all of our historic questions going back to 2010 about all offenders that were in custody at the time in a consistent way and in a way that we're able to query what's actually going on. So this solves blocker one. We've now got up-to-date, relevant, timely data. Second question, 
systematic understanding of, of violence. And this is where OR researchers go, ooh, because this is a textbook OR question, right? What is it that makes people violent in custody? And so we turned it into a more standard OR question. How many violent incidents is person X going to be involved in over the next year? We need it at that individual granular level because that's where we're making decisions. We're making decisions, <coughs> do we move this person to a different wing? Do, does this person maybe need the intervention in a different prison? Do we need to split up these two people? So that's what we're informing. And what we developed is the violence in prison estimator, or the VIPER score. VIPER has two components. Um, it firstly fits a spline function, a polynomial spline, based on age of the person at the time because we know that people are more violent when they're younger in custody because of, we're selecting the most violent young people. Um, so you can maybe see in the chart, the gray dotted line is the effect of age. So you can see that it sort of slopes down. B is the more complicated part where we use random effects to estimate an individual propensity for violence, but correcting for the amount of violence in their environment at the time. So this is based on a generalized linear mixed model with both fixed effects of age and of their time that they spent in custody back then, and random effects for prison, the year, because violence levels have been slowly going up over the years, and then an individual offender ID for each individual person. This looks fairly simple on paper. That last one is what blows the computing uh, power. Um, and that's quite a, an innovative, unique way of using the ID, because essentially what it does is it tries to assign any variance it can't assign to the other coefficients to offender ID. And that allows us to estimate, is this person more or less violent than someone comparable to them in their situation at the time? Um, that's what gives us a Viper score as a number. And the reason that's so valuable is because it's really easy to use. People understand what Viper means because it's in terms of how many instances is this person going to be involved in if they stay in custody for the whole next year. What's also really good about it is that it's standardized across prisons because prison variance is separated out. So when someone moves prison, if someone moves to a more, generally more violent prison, their score doesn't just randomly spike. That's useful. Um, the other useful thing is that we were able to test for implicit and explicit bias in the model. We're able to add things like ethnicity and gender and see that none of the variance was going onto those variables. We also know that Viper scores don't have a significant differences between those groups. So we're not like grouping one demographic to be randomly much, much higher. Um, the final useful thing is the fact that it slowly drops over time because of this downward curve of age. Incidents that happened when you were 18 are weighted less heavily than incidents that happen when you're 25, which means that if you stay in custody for a long time, things don't continue to haunt you over time. The final thing we need to talk, think about, though, is how do we communicate uncertainty? Because people come into custody for the first time, and what Viper does is it says, oh, you haven't had any violence, but you're 24, so I'm going to assign you the average code for 24. <coughs> That's not useful. <laughs> That's, I mean, it's, it's a good way of comparing people, but it's not useful for individual management. So we assign people a star rating based on the standard error around their coefficient. Um, so that we're able to communicate to users, be careful about this score, have the actual chat, which they should be doing anyway. So this gave us a sort of a systematic way of talking about violence, of talking about violence individuals between prisons, within prisons, and thinking about how to best manage these most sort of problematic individuals in the population. But we hadn't solved the final blocker, which was that people weren't really using the data. We needed to give people the actual insights, and we needed to really think about how we deliver the OR to people. Because let's, let's reality check, this is what people's IT looks like. This is just an example, but people were dealing with sort of old school databases, not really able to extract the information they need in a useful way, especially when you think about these people are running around wings all the time. They're not allowed their phones, they're not allowed technology on the wing. So they have 20 minutes in front of a desktop and then they go again. So we need to think about how we deliver the insights that we're able to deliver. And that's why we developed the safety diagnostic tool, which we launched in June 2018. It's built on our shiny with a bunch of custom HTML D3 charts, that sort of thing. 
um, and it seamlessly integrates with existing IT, so people don't have to you know, go to a different desktop in a different room. It just works on their own IT. Because what we had done at that point, we'd made data available, we'd given people insights, and we were about to be able to give people those insights in an intuitive way. And all those things combined make the safety diagnostic tool, which really revolutionizes how we were able to deliver those things to prisons. And we were able to deliver those things from operational frontline staff who were doing the collection for us. You know, we're very grateful to those people. We want to make sure that they keep doing their job. All the way to senior leadership, governor teams who were making decisions about how do we manage violence at the population level. And all of those people were involved as we were developing this tool to make sure that all of their needs were being met. So this is where I'd like to show you a version. This version uses uh, fake Game of Thrones locations for prisons. <laughs> Not to make light of the data we're talking about, we just need to make sure that you know, there's nothing sensitive in here. All right, so this is what it looks like without the Game of Thrones data. <laughs> um, so essentially what it covers is assaults, types of assaults, people specify if something was serious and if, if staff was involved. Then for self-harm instance, we see both how many people and how many incidents, because people tend to get quite prolific. People tend to use it as a coping mechanism repeatedly. Um, and then dual harm, which academia suggests that um, people who self-harm also tend to assault people and the other way around, out of just frustration, which is a slightly different group from people who self-harm purely to cope. Then bottom right is just a list of the most recent incidents. And this is, again, this example of someone sitting in typing on Thursday and their colleague on Friday needed to know what happened. And that's what this list is for. And then the bottom left, this is where Viper gets put front and center as these are your top 10 Viper people in your population right now. Can you do a quick check in your head? Have we got management plans for all of them? Because if you haven't, they might make more victims. That's the short of it. And people use these Viper scores continuously to think about how we inform our briefings. Now, the safety diagnostic tool has been massive. It's been absolutely wonderful, the uptake. So we have 45,000 registered users. We get 200 unique people every day across 100 prisons. Um, so this is available to all public and private prisons in England and Wales. Um, and we see about 10 different people in every prison using it. So we, we also see it in the amount of feedback we get of people being, when we roll out a new feature, being really excited, or if we need to take something down for maintenance, people immediately notice and tell us, oh, this thing is gone. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we know, sorry. <laughs> so it's become part of everyday life for prison staff. Um, they use it for managing populations. They use it for managing new receptions, thinking about who am I about to come in? And should I make sure that the nurse is available to make sure we get their medication right immediately? Questions like that. And you know, the feedback doesn't lie. People say it's, the, it's their go-to tool for pretty much all safety-related questions because it just answers their questions on a single page, whereas before they needed to dig through tables and tables and tables. So we've enabled data-driven decisions. People do population management within their own prison, across all prisons. Um, People use it to determine the security levels people need, upgrade and downgrade it. Um, it allows people to make more bespoke interventions because you spend less time figuring out if someone kept getting into fights in their previous prison, which means you can spend more time thinking about, well, what, what is it that sets you off? Why? What's going wrong? How can we help? And it saves enormous amounts of staff time. And we can see this as a, as a culture change because we see this happening. So 2016 versus 2018, you see that, well, the colors aren't super helpful, but you know, about 90%, well, 85% of data is collected on time, so within X number of hours. That was true before as well. But what people are now doing is actually giving us the auxiliary data, things like why did the assault happen, the reason for an assault has gone from 50 up, 75%. People understand why data matters, and people understand how it can help them, and so they want to give us that data so we can do more with it for them. And so we have gone from a place where data, where prison craft was the only thing that people were using, 
to a place where people are using OR outputs, data, knowledge to inform their interventions before they come in. So we've given people up-to-date information, we've given people advanced analytics, and we've given people the actual insights they need to use it in their everyday, in the operations. And it's helping them make prison safer. And that's what we're here for. Thank you very much.